Sarah Schaefer and I'm our Conservation Outreach Coordinator here at the Brevard Zoo. I work in our Conservation Department and I work on a program called Restore Our Shores. So a little bit about Brevard Zoo. We're located in Melbourne, Florida and we opened 26 years ago in 1994 and we have quite a few people visiting us every year. We also have a lot of animals. We have close to 200 different species of animals. And although we have all these animals and all these people coming to visit us, we only have about 207 employees, just like me, taking care of all those people and all the animals. We do hold a world record for the largest community zoo built. In 1992, we brought together 16,000 people to help build our zoo. But the reason that we're all here today, the Indian River Lagoon, the Indian River Lagoon is pretty big. It consists of three different bodies of water. So we have the Mosquito Lagoon up here in the north, and then we have the Indian River, which runs all the way down here, and then we have the Banana River, which is on this side over here. So it's pretty large. It's 156 miles long, so it would take you about two and a half hours to drive the entire thing. It's very big, but 71% of the lagoon is right here at home in Brevard County with us. So that's why it's so important that we're focused on keeping our lagoon healthy, since so much of it is located right here. Now it is super big, but it's also really special. It's very biologically diverse. There are a lot of different species of plants and animals that live there. Actually about 4,000 different species of plants and animals. Now the reason that we're able to have this great biodiversity is because the lagoon spans two different climate zones. So we have the temperate climate zone up top, and then we have the subtropical climate zone down here at the bottom. So we're able to have plants and animals that are in both of those different areas, which is why it's so biologically diverse. But we do call it the river, and we also call it the Indian River Lagoon, so it's a bit confusing. I just said the word estuary, so which one is it? Is it a river? Is it a lagoon? Is it an estuary? It is a lagoon, and it's an estuary. So it's made up of brackish water, so it's not super salt water, and it's not completely fresh water. It's a little bit in between, and it's also separated by the ocean by a system of barrier islands. So those things make it a lagoon and an estuary, not actually a river. But is our lagoon super healthy right now? What do you guys think? No, it's not super healthy, and it took a long time to get this way. Decades of pollution and nutrient loading going into our lagoon, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of phosphorus, and it all settled down and created this nice, gross muck layer down at the bottom. It's that kind of black mayonnaise-y stuff that we feel sometimes. Then, in winter of 2015, we had some really funky weather. We had a lot of rain, a lot of wind, and it stirred up that muck all into the water column. And we had a really bad algae bloom. So all those extra nutrients helped to fuel that algae bloom. And then when that algae died, it uses up all the dissolved oxygen in the water when it starts decaying. And that's what our fish and our other animals need to breathe. So that's when we had our big fish kill in March of 2016. But we didn't want to just leave those fish there like this. This is a canal completely full with dead fish. Also, this is a shoreline of dead fish. But like I said, we didn't want to leave these guys there. We wanted to remove them because when fish break down, they just add more nutrients to the water that we already have too many of. So Brevard Zoo, Keep Brevard Beautiful, Marine Resources Council, Brevard County, and other organizations all banded together and helped to remove as many of those fish as we possibly could to start that lagoon on the process of healing. So we're not just going to leave the lagoon like that. We do have a plan. It's a four-part plan, and it is the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Project Plan. Now, this is the half-cent sales tax that we passed in 2016, and it's a four-part plan. So we plan to reduce pollution inputs by cutting down on that fertilizer, also converting some of those septic systems to sewer, working on our stormwater. So we also want to remove detrimental muck. So like I said, that gross black mayonnaise muck layer down there, we're dredging for muck. So we're pretty much taking a chunk of those nutrients out and moving them somewhere else. So we're not just going to make new spoil islands or something out of this muck. It can actually go to a better process. So it goes through a process called dewatering, and then we're able to use it for a soil additive or for agriculture. So you can use it for road construction.
construction. The third part is to restore oysters, clams, and wetlands. That's our living shorelines, and that's where Restore Our Shores comes in. So the plan is to restore 20 miles of oyster reef and living shoreline over the next 10 years, the span of the plan. And the goal with this, 20 miles of oyster reef and living shoreline should be enough to filter the volume of the lagoon annually. Then the fourth part, respond. So we want to respond to any new information that we learn along the way. Like I said, this is a 10 year plan. So we make new advances in science and technology. We also learn from our experience with our other projects. And we want to be able to update those plans as we go along. So here's that in a little bit more detail. We're going to reduce by 25%. Also remove 25% of that detrimental muck. That's the 20 miles that I mentioned earlier. And then we were able to have annual plan updates through our Citizens Oversight Committee that oversees the Save Our Indian River Lagoon project plan. I mentioned living shorelines. What is a living shoreline? So this is a method of shoreline stabilization that takes natural plants and oyster reefs and brings them together to create a softer green structure. Those oyster reefs down at the bottom help to act as a breakwater so that way the waves are a little bit smaller when they make it up to that shoreline and it helps to protect those plants that are helping to protect the shoreline. I know it's a little bit difficult to see this slide, but I just want you to take a look at the pictures. Here in Brevard County, many of our shorelines are hardened. There's a very small percentage of shorelines here in Brevard that have not been altered by humans. So we have seawalls, we have bulkheads, also riprap, those big rocks that you see along the shoreline. But we're working towards that living shoreline, the greener structures that I mentioned. So even if you have a seawall or you have riprap or bulkheads, it doesn't mean that you can't add different elements to your shoreline to make it more of a living shoreline. You can add oyster reefs or some of those shoreline species and even mangroves. So the benefits of a living shoreline. You know, some of these you think that you would know already. So just from the pictures here, the top picture shows a shoreline with a seawall. It's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see a little bit of erosion happening back here as those waves come across the seawall and begin to wash out behind that structure. Also, there's something missing in this picture that's not missing in the other one. And that is an abundance of plants and animals. When you have a living shoreline, it creates a really important spawning habitat for animals. So where all the baby animals are going to live. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It's also a lot prettier than a seawall. You have those beautiful plants on your shoreline. It's gorgeous. And it's also much more long term. You do have to replace seawalls after a while. They do tend to break down and it's also very expensive. Fortunately, you never have to replace your living shoreline. It continues to grow and change along with the lay of the land. So why mangroves? Why are we growing mangroves in this classroom right now? Why are we so focused on mangroves at the zoo? And why do we use them so much in our projects? So mangroves protect Florida shorelines from erosion. They have huge roots that you can see some of in these pictures and they help to hold on to those sediments to hold that shoreline together. Also, they're able to uptake a lot of those nutrients that we talked about, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and take those guys out of the water to help with that nutrient overload problem that we have. Also, creates one of the basic food web resources for marine organisms. So obviously mangroves have leaves, and those leaves will fall off after a while. And when they fall into the water and they start breaking down and decaying, it creates something called detritus. And this detritus is one of the basic, basic beginnings of the food web. So these teeny tiny marine organisms will feed on those guys. And then a larger organism will eat them, and it goes all the way up the food chain. And that's the very beginning. And we wouldn't really have that without the mangroves. Also, we talked about this one a little bit, but it improves the water quality and clarity. It's going to be a lot clearer if you have those mangroves in the water removing all those nutrients out of there. They are used as a breeding grounds for many animals. It's really important spawning habitat for a lot of animals and also nursery habitat. So one that's pretty cool is actually the bull shark. So bull shark moms come into the Indian River Lagoon and they will have their babies in the seagrass beds by the mangroves. 
and those baby baby sh baby bull sharks they will live there for a while until they're about six feet long and then they'll go ahead and move out into more open waters also birds really like the mangroves they create rookeries or nests in the top of the trees so just like the indian river lagoon you will see many different species in the mangroves these are some of the friendly faces that you might see in the mangroves. We have our nice lemon shark up here in the top left corner. You'll see alligators and even further down south crocodiles, which is pretty neat. We have our osprey and other shoreline birds. And then we have our snook down here, as well as a lot of other game fish. And then right here in the middle, my favorite, the manatee. These guys all live in and around the mangroves. Now mangroves are salt tolerant, but they don't necessarily require salt to grow. Now according to the textbooks, mangroves are supposed to grow in a pretty specific way. We're supposed to have the red mangrove, the furthest in the water, and then you have the white and the black mangrove a little bit more on the shoreline. But our mangroves in Brevard County don't really pay attention to the textbooks. They grow all together. We also have the buttonwood, our mangrove associate, mixed in there too. So we have all these guys growing together to help hold those shorelines in place. The red mangrove is the one that you have in your classrooms right now that you guys are gonna get a chance to plant and take care of for your whole school year. These are your propagules right here. This is exactly what you're gonna put into your pot. Once they grow a little bit more, it's gonna look like this seedling right here. And then in many, many, many years, once you bring it back to the zoo and we plant it in the Indian River Lagoon, it's gonna look like this big tree right here. We do call the red mangrove the walking tree because it has these huge prop roots, also drop roots over here. So they extend out into the water and then those drop roots drop straight down and that helps them to remove all those nutrients that we were talking about. Now, like I said, mangroves are salt tolerant. So sometimes they get a little bit too much salt and they've got to get rid of that. So red mangroves store salt in their leaves and then the oldest leaves, when they go ahead and fall off, that helps them to get rid of that excess salt. Now for a while, many people thought that it was the yellow leaves that fell off and they were the sacrificial leaf. But since then we've learned that it doesn't necessarily have to be a yellow leaf, it's just the older leaves. The black mangrove is the next one we're going to talk about. These guys are a little bit different than the reds. The leaves are a different color on the bottom. They're a little bit more silvery on the bottom, while the red mangrove is all green. Their propagules also look a little bit different down here. And when they open up, they look like a book, like a little book. And then they start to sprout that little seedling, like this guy here. Now, they have very different roots than the red mangrove. These guys have pneumatophores. We also call them snorkel roots or zombie fingers because they reach straight out of the soil. So they're able to grow in really anoxic or oxygen deficient conditions. Now, they also have to exclude their salt, but they do it a tad bit differently. They're gonna excrete their salt out of their leaves, almost like pores, like we excrete our sweat. So you can see it a little bit on this leaf right here, those little salt crystals. So just like potato chips to us, those salty leaves are really tasty to a lot of animals. So a lot of those guys like to munch on the black mangroves. The last one that we're gonna talk about is the white mangroves. These look very different from the other two that we talked about. They have a nice rounded leaf and they do have seeds, not propagules. So these guys do have to be germinated before they can start growing. And then when they sprout, they start growing, they're gonna look like this little teeny tiny seedling right here. And that's your adult white mangrove plant on the other side. These also exclude their salt, but they're gonna get rid of that salt through little nodes on their branches. So they excrete that salty substance, but they're called nectaries. So they also excrete a nectar type substance that's really sweet. So many times you'll see the white mangrove completely covered in insects like ants, because they think they're pretty tasty. So what can you do? We talked about all these reasons why mangroves are amazing and we need so many of them and we need to restore the lagoon with mangroves. You guys are doing exactly the best thing that you could possibly do for mangroves in the lagoon by growing these in your classroom. Mangroves take a really long time to grow and we don't have a ton of space to store mangroves here at the zoo. So we rely on people just like you that will help grow them for us 
So they're a little bit bigger when they come back, and then we're able to plant them in the lagoon. Now when you get a little bit older and you might have your own house on the lagoon, there are different guidelines that you have to follow for mangroves. So if you ever build a dock or if your parents are planning on building a dock somewhere on the water, making sure that you're designing that around the mangroves and also keeping those guys there instead of completely removing them during construction. Now, if you are looking for community service hours for Bright Futures or for school, you can log your hours that you're using from caring for your mangrove and also potting it and watching this in your classroom right now towards your community service hours. Now, it's not going to be very many hours because it doesn't take a very long time to water your mangroves, but it does count towards those. And if you're looking for more community service opportunities, go ahead and reach out to me, again, Callie Schaefer at cschaefer at brevardzoo.org, and I can get you matched with some of those volunteer opportunities. If you didn't have enough time to get that one, go ahead and talk to your teacher. They'll have my contact information. Now that we have learned all about these fantastic plants, it is time to plant our mangroves, the time that you've all been waiting for. So we're going to take our propagule right here, and we're also going to take our pot and our soil. We're going to take our pot and we're going to fill it about a third of the way with that potting soil. And then you're going to take your mangrove propagule and you're going to place it in your pot with the brown side down. It grows from the green side, so we want to make sure the brown side is down. And then we're going to take the rest of that soil, fill it up to the top where that top line is, and then you're going to pat it down and make sure if you need some more soil, you add that in. Tamp that soil down a little bit so your mangrove has a nice sturdy base to get it growing. So your mangrove is planted. Good job, guys. Now you've got to learn how to take care of your mangrove. So mangroves are tropical plants for a reason. They're like me. They don't like the cold. If it gets around the 50s, they definitely want to be brought inside. If you're not able to bring them inside, go ahead and cover them with a sheet or a blanket overnight until it warms up a little bit for them the next day. Water. Mangroves love water. They grow in the water, near the water. They can even grow underwater. So you cannot overwater your mangrove. They love water. So try to water your mangrove every day. If you don't have time to water it every day, I suggest putting it in a Tupperware container like this picture over here on the bottom corner. That way it'll soak up the water with those roots and you won't have to water it quite as much. Also really helpful if you'd ever like to go on vacation. Light is also really important for mangroves. So they like indirect sunlight. What we're trying to do with that indirect sunlight is replicate what happens to these guys in the wild. So when the propagules fall off the parent plant, they're gonna wash back up under that big tree and take root. So they're gonna get a little bit of sun, but they're also gonna get quite a bit of shade from that big plant. So we wanna have indirect sunlight. So find an area that's not completely in the sun, but it's also not completely in the shade. Usually a breezeway at school is good, or also a back area, somewhere under an overhang, or if you'd even like to keep them in your classroom on the windowsill. That always works pretty well too. Fertilizer. Like we said in the beginning, there is already enough fertilizer in our lagoon. Too many nutrients are ready. We don't want to add to this problem. So your plants are not going to need fertilizer. They're going to grow just fine with that water and the sunlight that you're going to give them. Especially if you keep your plants outside, sometimes you may see some friendly faces. One of those could possibly be mealybugs. They look like little bits of cotton fuzz that can grow on the joints or on the leaves of your plant. They're not too much of a problem, but if you do see them and you want to get rid of them, just go ahead and take your hand and some water or a washcloth, wet paper towel, and just wipe these guys right off. They're pretty easy to take care of. You also might see some plant scale especially on your red mangroves. It looks just like it's called. It looks like a little scale. It doesn't quite look like a bug. And you're going to get rid of these guys the same way. So just your hand and some water, washcloth, wet paper towel. Just go ahead and wipe those guys right off. The last one we're going to talk about is sooty mold that you may find in association with the other two. And I bet you can guess how you're going to get rid of this one. Yep, the water and a wet washcloth, paper towel, all of those things. We don't want to use any pest control chemicals for the same reason that we don't want to use that fertilizer. The lagoon already has enough of those things. We don't want to add any more. 
So again, just the water will be enough to get rid of those nice, uh, nice creatures there. So what now? You guys are going to care for your mangroves at school or at home. And keep in touch. I love getting pictures of your mangroves. You can name them if you like. I think it helps them grow a little bit better. And then we'll be in touch too. So once you're finished with your school year and you're ready to return your mangroves, your teachers can reach out to us. And if we don't hear from you, we'll reach out to you too. But this would not be possible without volunteers just like you guys. Our whole program is only, only successful because of volunteers. We really couldn't do any of the work that we do without you guys. And the mission of Brevard Zoo, wildlife conservation through education and participation. Thank you so much for listening today. If you guys would like more information or are interested in learning more about the program, go ahead and visit us at RestoreOurShores at BrevardZoo.org and we will help to guide you to those opportunities. Thank you so much and thank you for your dedication to saving our lagoon. Have a great year.